In the last video, we talked about water evaporating, changing state for liquid to vapor, what's caused this system to work. And the catch is, because we're dealing with water, we have much, much more maintenance to deal with. And one of the things, this whole unit is installed outside. This is fitting through the window, or maybe it's a downflow, or something's blowing into the house. But the majority of the system is outside. So the sun's baking on the paint, you also end up with rain, and you're going to end up with rust because we're dealing with water inside and rain on the outside. There's a lot of design aspects that go through this and understanding how this is designed helps you understand how to service and maintain it. First off, we're gonna start with these louvers. If we notice these louvers are facing inward, most of the time louvers are the other direction, but they need to be inward for this specific unit. We're gonna be running water from the top side down and that water is gonna be trying to splash out. Well, the idea is the water on the inside hits these louvers and they're constantly being redirected back inside. And if we end up with a rainy situation where the rain's blowing in, it's still okay because it just collects that water and puts it into the drain pan, which we're gonna talk about shortly. So that water is constantly being pushed back in. At some point in time, you see that water splash, not draining well, and that water overflows, and we end up with this rust starting to happen. So if you see this rust and start looking for the reasons why and correct it before it starts getting deep like this one is, you can typically save the system. On the back side of the panel, we have some type of material like this. Now it's important for us to get that water as fine as possible because thick water doesn't evaporate well, but smaller, thinner grains of water do evaporate well. So this type of material is great for absorbing the water. It starts getting soaked. It gets fully saturated first, and then we continuously run water over this. And that allows that water to evaporate very well. So when you first turn these things on, you have to let the pump run so that you saturate all of this material first before you turn the unit on. If you turn the fan on and the pump on at the same time, the water evaporates before you get this whole pad soaked. So for example, let's say we're only getting wet right here and right here. Well, now you're pulling in 100 degree air on both sides and you're only having evaporation on that one little section. So it doesn't cool as well. But if we give it time and let this whole entire thing soak first, then we turn the fan on and now we have evaporation of all of the air coming through. Now these don't last very long. Typically you only get one season out of this because all of the chemicals and all of the stuff that's left over in the air ends up on these pads. Most places you end up with a lot of calcium and that calcium turns this into an absolute brick. And there's many different styles and designs of how you replace these, but this typically only lasts one year. If you're doing that maintenance on these and it's rooftop units, for example, in a very dry climate, make sure you take these off the roof. You don't wanna leave them on the roof because every time it rains, they get resaturated and it can cause roof damage and it just simply looks ugly. Sometimes students will get on the roof and they'll say, why did somebody leave these white bricks on the roof? And really it's just this fabric that just gets saturated with calcium and it just turns to a rock and it's not great for anybody. So take those off the roof. And if you're working with this and you're changing these pads out, make sure you wear a mask because all of the air, all the filtration, all the dust, everything gets collected on here on top of all the calcium. So as you start pulling these off and you start disrupting all of these fibers, you're breathing that stuff in. So make sure you wear some kind of a mask when you're working on this, so you're not breathing all that in, and wear some kind of gloves. Because you're dealing with water and sharp, rusty metal objects, a cut from rust can cause an issue, and also there's other types of bacteria that can grow in this water, and as we get cut or damaged, that can cause an issue and let it get into our body, such as flesh-eating bacteria, which we don't want to have happen. But if we treat that water, we take care of it, it's not an issue, but again, wearing gloves, wearing a mask, helps really reduce a lot of those risks. We're gonna come back to this, let's take a look inside. Now, because we're dealing with water and water evaporating, we have to have a method of bringing water in. So this small little line right here runs outside of the unit through this little hole. That means that we're going to have exposed water lines outside of the house. So in the winter time, these must be shut off and all of that water drained out of this hose so that hose doesn't break. So this water usually has an adapter that comes from an outside water spigot and that water comes all the way to this little valve right here. And this little valve is what we call a float valve. That water comes into this little valve right here and that water starts spraying right down into the basin. And this whole basin is essentially just a storage tank for the water. So we'll start filling this up with water. So we get more and more water, we get in here, but the problem is if we get too much water, it's gonna overflow on the edges and cause it to rust out like it was earlier. 
So now we install this little float, and all it is is a little tank, so to speak. And as that water level increases, this float starts lifting up. And as this float lifts up, it actually has a valve over here that shuts the water off. And you can adjust this by bending this piece of metal here, or some have different types of adjustment screws, so you can have the level where you need it. If you don't have this adjusted correctly, it will overfill and you rust out on the outsides. And if you don't have it correctly the other way, you don't have enough water in here for when the pump comes on to keep everything wet. So where this is in the system is important. You typically want that water level below this little line right here. So just below that little line, and that helps prevent everything from overflowing, rusting out, and it usually works pretty good. There is an overflow we'll talk about here in just a little bit, but essentially this valve right here, this little float valve, is what maintains the water level and then this hose connects all the way outside to the water spigot or water faucet. So here's that same float switch from the, the other side of the unit. But if we see inside where this pan is at the bottom, there's all of this rust. And we can see that this paint right here is just coming loose. It's flaking off of there. So the water's gotten underneath that paint. This is why maintenance is so important with this. What we'd have to do is scrape all of this paint off the bottom, use a wire brush and get as much of this rust off as possible. And they make a product called Cooler Coat, which is simply just a tar-like paint. And we would paint the entire bottom of this all the way up the sides to help seal that so that it wouldn't rust out and it provides a little bit more life to the system. If we look over here on this side, this is our drain and also our overflow. We have the holes here at the top so if the water level gets too high, it runs over and runs out of the hole at the very bottom. And if I need to drain the water out of this, I can reach inside I can loosen and unscrew this valve right here. And then all the water would be draining out through that hole. It's important to remember that if you're going to be working with this water to wear gloves and wear some kind of a respirator, some kind of a mask, because you don't know what's growing or living inside of this water. So at the end of summer, you want to make sure you take this plug out so all that water can drain out. I typically like to leave the plug loose and sitting off to the side so that if any rain, any else water gets in, it has a place to go and it's not sitting inside this pan all winter long. But you can see how corrosive that water is where it causes everything to rust. So now that we've gotten water into this pan, we also then have to pump it to the pads. This is where our pump comes into place. So here's just a very simple little pump. It has a little metal shaft that runs to the bottom and the pump sections here in the bottom. Here you can see it's covered with all of this kind of netting and really the netting's job is to make sure we collect as much of the sediments, as much of the dirt on the netting before it gets hung up in the pump action itself. Now this is an electric motor, so the motor's up here in the top side, so we have the pump section on the bottom side and we have this little hose that's pumping up. These motors are notorious for failing, especially where we have this metal shaft, that shaft rusts out and I asked one of the manufacturers, why don't you make this with a stainless steel shaft and they said the main reason is because the shaft would then outlast the whole entire pump and usually the impellers in here get corroded with calcium and that calcium eats away the pump. Which brings us to the next thing of maintenance. So once we have this coated and sealed off, we're going to have water sitting in here and as that water evaporates, it leaves behind the minerals and one of those minerals being calcium. What we can do is we can put some products inside of here that help keep that calcium from building up. It also helps prevent anything from growing inside of here. There's also some all natural methods such as pure silver. If you're to put pure silver in the bottom, it prevents things from growing, but who can afford pure silver? The other newest method is they have a second pump. There's a separate pump in here that the calcium of the water. And that pump will actually connect to the very top of this drain port. And when the calcium buildup or mineral buildups get too high, the secondary pump comes on and actually takes all of the water out of this basin and it pumps it out here outside of the unit, usually onto the ground. By doing that, as the calcium level gets high, we flush all that out, we bring in fresh water through our float switch, and now we have a lower calcium or a lower mineral rate in that water and it helps this last longer. So the older ones, you only had one pump, but the newer ones, you have two pumps and that second pump was simply just to drain that water back out when the calcium levels got too high. Now our primary pump is gonna be sucking that water from the bottom and then pumping it up through this tube right here. And that tube connects all the way up here to the very top and we have three hoses going to the three sides. Remember this side is up against the house. So this tube carries water to the panel on that side. It carries water to the panel on this side. And then the third one goes to the water to the panel on the back side. So once we get that water to the back side, it simply opens up and drops right down on top of this trough. And then that allows the water to drop all the way down through these panels. 
that tube would allow that water to drop right here and start filling up this little V channel. If you see on one side of this V channel, we have all these little bitty notches right here. So that water fills up this V channel and starts running through all of these notches. So that way it'll start running down and start soaking this pad up. And notice it's putting the water on the outside edge where all the fins are because that's where it's gonna dry out first. So we put the water on this side and then the fan actually helps pull the water through to the other side. Now it's important to notice there's a lot of dust and dirt inside of here. So when you're doing maintenance, you also have to take this and wash all this out and clean all of the little dust and calcium out of these little grooves so that it equally coats the entire pad. I've seen it before to where only one side will be filling up, the other side's all clogged up, and you don't get any water flow on this side, so it's just hot air coming in. It's very important that we get water equally through all of this pad so we get the equal amount of water everywhere. And then, as that water drains all the way down to the pad, it ends up at this little bottom little tray right here. This tray fits inside of this unit, and at the very bottom side, we have these holes here yet again, and these holes allow that water to fall back into the pan. So that water is constantly being recycled over and over again. It's taking water from the bottom of the pan up to the top. From there, it drips all the way across this drip bar. From there, it soaks the entire pad, and then the water left over drips out the holes in the bottom back into this tank. And as water evaporates, changing state from a liquid to a vapor, we end up with less and less water the float switch starts to drop and it lets some fresh water come back in and the cycle just keeps happening. The float switch keeps it filled with water as water evaporates. The pump keeps the water circulating over all of the pads, keeping everything wet. And then before the next year, you'd come through and take these pads, take them out, put new pads in, do all your maintenance, cleaning, and you're ready to go again. But wait, there's more. That was just the water side. We also have the air side. Here we have our motor, and notice how our motor is an air-cooled motor. So our motor is kept up here at the top, trying to be away from the water as much as possible, but it still lives in a very wet environment. So here this is aluminum, and you can see how the aluminum is corroded on this motor, and it's common for us to end up with bearings that get corroded and all of that. You can also see the rust on the end of the shaft, so this is pretty common. We have a belt, and you notice this belt is completely shot, so this belt is definitely needs to go. Typically, you put a new belt on every spring before the summer comes. Are you doing all your other maintenance? You go ahead and put a new belt on. Now, to adjust the tension of the belt, you have this little adjustment screw here. And as you loosen that on each side, it allows this motor to twist this way to loosen the belt or back this way to tighten that belt back up. Notoriously, people either over tighten them or keep them loose. We're going to save belt adjustments for another class on another day. So this is our drive pulley. It's what the motor is driving. And this is our driven pulley. This is what's being driven by the drive pulley. So primary, secondary, and it's common for if you have a belt that's loose and squeaking, like eek, 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 every time, it'll actually put a groove in the driven pulley. So you have to inspect these pulleys to make sure there's no cracks, make sure it's not smoothed out, make sure it's in good shape. So now that we got the power going from the motor through the belt over here to the shaft, we have more bearings to deal with. So back here, we have what we call pillow blocks. And it's just simply a big, oilable, greasable bearing. So we have one here on this side, and all the way here on the back side, we're gonna have another one. So we have to oil these every single spring to make sure that they're gonna last through the summer. Now this is a really old model because it actually had oil caps inside of it. We literally dripped oil into there. Here's a little better close up. You can see this is our pillow block, and this is where you would put the oil in. So now they usually have the type of grease certs where you can grease them up, but this old one here, we actually had this little cap. You would pull this cap up and you would literally pour your oil in right there in that hole. So this is one of the pillow blocks and then the other one would be on the other side. You can see how this one's easier to get to because we don't have the wheel in the way. But this is the shaft that goes all the way through. It's just an iron shaft. You can see it's rusted up. Here's our bearing that's here. And this is that little cap we open up to oil it. So we get done oiling it, we shut it back. And again, all the new ones now have a grease cert fitting. But you can see all the rust that's on this. So there's not much you can do once you get that much rust. Once it starts to fail, you can replace these bearings because all you have to do is sand this part of the shaft. You can get these off. It's not fun at all. It's a big pain, but it's doable. But once this part starts rusting out, this holds the whole thing together. They do have set screws where you can take them apart, but I've had very bad luck trying to do anything with it. And really, if you see the rust gets this far, and that rust also ends up down here at these fins for the blower wheel. And you can see this one's severely eaten up. All the paint's gone. There's a lot of rust on here. It throws this whole entire thing out of balance. 
uh, but that's typical. You have water running across here, and there's only so much maintenance you can do. Once you get to this point, this one's pretty much shut. Uh, there's not anything much I can do with it, but most people just run them until they absolutely completely come apart. But there is a significant amount of rust in this old boy, so it's just about done. So as far as electrical goes, it's pretty simple. We have two wires coming in. This one goes all the way down to the pump. So when you replace this pump, wiring it's pretty easy. You just simply unplug it, plug the new one in, make sure you cable tie your wires where they're out of the water. The motor pump's a little different. You have a little panel right here you open up. The motor doesn't come with the wire when you replace it. This is what we call resilient blocks. So you take this screw loose and it disconnects the clamp from the motor on each side. These little rubber gaskets come with the new one and that helps absorb the shock when this motor starts and stops. Of course, you have to shut the power off. You take this screw loose on both sides. Then you take this panel off and you unhook all the wires inside. And this is a multiple speed motor. If we follow these wires, they go to the outside of the cabinet. And this side would be in the house. There's a grill here that's missing, but this is our fan switch all the way up for high, in the middle for off, and all the way down for low. And this is the switch for the pump. This one just says cooling, but it's off and on. So if you were to start this up, you would turn it on and give it time for all the pads to get soaked. And then you could turn your fan on to start moving that air from outside across the pads, allowing for evaporation and then, and then blowing that cool, moist air inside the house. And here's another angle of that blower wheel. You can just see all the rust built up and all the rust in the backside. This one's just seen its better days. So as far as the wiring comes, the wiring from that motor comes all the way inside this box. You shouldn't need to open this up to replace the motor. It's all done in the other cap. And then you shouldn't need to open this up for the pump either because that's just a simply a plug on the other side. The wiring comes here and that is just simply goes to a 110 volt plug that plugs inside the house. It's important to note too that at the end of the summer, you would take this completely out of the window so that you don't have that cool draft coming in in the middle of winter. You'd be losing a ton of heat through this even if it shut off and drained. If it was a rooftop system, this opening here would be straight down. It'd be a, what you call a down flow and you'd cover the whole entire outside of the unit with a type of tarp. They make a cover for these that help prevent air movement. It helps insulate it and keeps uh, the moisture out of it. So if you lived in one of the cities I mentioned before, there's a lot of these, especially on commercial buildings. Now residential people that can pull this out of the window, slap a new one on, but the downflow ones are up on a roof. So even residential customers will be calling you, but especially with the commercial systems, these are much, much larger. They have to have all these pad maintenance done, the motors, the belts, the grease, all of this work has to be done, uh, the cooler coat. So there's a lot of maintenance. So the cost of maintaining one of these is significantly more, but on the other side is you're bringing lots of fresh air into the building. It's great for water filtration, assuming that you keep this water treated. And also when you're working this, again, I can't stress it enough, make sure you're wearing some kind of a mask and also gloves because bacteria does grow in here, especially when it's not taken care of and you're breathing all of that in. And if you get a cut in you, the bacteria from that water can very easily get into your system. So treat it. And the same thing with cooling towers. If you work with cooling towers for commercial buildings, that water, treat it as if it's a hazardous chemical. Uh, and then as you treat this and keep it clean, it won't be an issue for the homeowners or the business owners. So hopefully you live in a climate and never have to worry about these, but they do have their application. And when you come across it, at least you know what to look for. The only thing I forgot to mention is this little end right here, when you put it in, it needs to go in first and it actually drops behind this panel. That's essential so the water runs behind this panel and back into this tank here. I've seen people before make the mistake as they're putting these on, they'll leave this on the outside and that water runs across here, drips out, and then it drips on the outside, rusting this out and also causing problems with the roof. So when you put these on, you definitely need to make sure that's just inside, just like this one is. Then we push it in, we put a little latch on. Definitely shot, but that's the basics of how they work. Hope you learned something. Hope you never have to work on them. But if you do, you live in a very dry climate, very high likelihood you're going to be working these for commercial and residential systems up on the roof.